Okay, I'm here with Rodney Meldrum, and uh, we're here at the 2011 Mormon Miracle Manti pageant. Yes, yeah, and uh, it's really surprised to see a Mormon apologist here. Can I call you a Mormon apologist, Mr. Meldrum? That's fine. Yeah, that's fine. Okay, so tell us a little bit about what you're about and what distinctively uh, sets apart uh, the, the firm foundation. And yeah, go for it. Well, basically, I've been uh, involved with uh, doing genetics research on with Native American populations. And there's been a lot of talk about, um, you know, the Book of Mormon not being, you know, true because of the the uh, lack of any Semitic type DNA, um, the you know, in, in the Native American populations, and that is actually has been the case in the uh, in the Central and South American populations. But um, in the last few years, is actually uh, in the journal articles, there's been evidence that has actually been uh, very very eye opening when it comes down to the. Um, DNA that has there's five specific markers in the Native Americans around the Great Lakes area, the uh, Algonquin speaking language groups, and they have a DNA lineage um, that uh, that is also uh, very very closely related to lineages that are in Jewish populations um, around the world. The Ashkenazi Jews have this particular it's called haplogroup X. They have this uh, DNA lineage. They have um, uh, you know, there's the Ashkenazi Jews, the Sephardic Jews, Libyan, Moroccan, Tunisian, Jewish, all these different Jewish populations have a similar type of DNA. And then, uh, then there's actually Deborah Bolnick, who is a uh, geneticist from the University of California at Berkeley, um, was actually able to sequence DNA from 21 sets of remains from the ancient Hopewell mound building civilization in North America. And she found the same markers in those bones which carbon date um, back in uh, just you know, around the time of Christ. Could you explain a little bit about, um, so I mean obviously you're promoting the view, if I can just direct, North America in a setting for the Book of Mormon. Could you explain uh, real quickly the Hill Cumorah issue? Um, I mean basically uh, about the two Cumorah ideas and so forth or... or, or yeah, I, I read somewhere, did you have something on, your, on a piece of paper that one Cumorah, did you have, I saw something right? Only one Camorra. That's right in front of me. Okay. <laughs> now explain that for us. Okay. Uh, well, it, it, over the, the course of time, there have been uh, different ideas about where the Book of Mormon took place, and some have, have uh, thought that the Book of Mormon actually may have uh, uh, occurred in Central America. And if it did occur down there, because of the, the distances involved in this whole thing, um, it would be very difficult to get, you know, plates and so forth back and forth uh, all the way from Central and South America to New York and, and uh, this up area up here. And the Book of Mormon talks about the, uh, the Hill Cumorah. They talk about it, you know, in, in fact, uh, they continue to go back to the same hill time and time again. The Hill Rama of the Jaredite civilization was the Hill Cumorah of the Nephite civilization. And uh, people have said, well, there's got to be two Hill Cumorahs, one in Central America, one in North America. Who's saying that? Um, different scholars and uh, that you know have done research on the uh, the Book of Mormon and geography related stuff. I and mean, if I could throw this in here, sorry, but that that's the majority of Mormon scholars today, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I today, mean, you, you're pretty pretty bold for taking this more traditionalist stand on the geography of the Book of Mormon, right? I mean, I mean, that, I, I don't know it, if bold. I'm just I'm just yeah. following where the evidence is leading. <laughs> so that's basically where I'm coming. So Moroni, when the last battles, he's not traveling from Central America all the way up to New York. He, it's literally the last battles happening in New York. And that general, yeah. But actually, it's interesting though, because when the first people that came out, like the uh, and some of the early books in eight, early or mid mid 1800s. Um, you know, like the Antiquities of the State of New York. Uh, there's a book that's out that, uh, that was written back in, in uh, 1851. And they talk about the bone pits and, uh, and huge numbers of skeletons that were found. Um, not necessarily right next to the hill, but actually kind of almost radiating out from the hill as you go further and further out, several counties even over. And it makes a lot of sense. The Nephites had uh, apparently you know, several years to prepare for that final battle. And they threw up, uh, you know, heaps of earth, and they, they made ditches and earth banks and so forth as they were, as they were doing it. So now, when the church bought the more of the land down there in the early 1900s, that's probably the assumption, right, that the events are, have so taken place the, there. I think it's the late 1800s, if I remember. I'm sorry. Go ahead. I, I'm wrong. I don't know. No, I, I, <laughs> I, I'm just off top of my head. I remember reading about it, but that oh, maybe I'm thinking about the dedication of some sort of. Uh, special place there, but when they yeah. purchased the land, though, the, the assumption though is that this is special because of 
the events of the Book of Mormon yeah, being associated absolutely. with them, right? Yeah, yeah absolutely. And that, and that's been held for by by uh, the leadership of the church pretty much for about 150 years or so. You know that that that, that is the hill where the final battles took place. So can you talk a little bit about Joseph Smith and this, um, would you call it the Heartland Geography Theory or the Great Lakes? Uh, heartland is what it's, mo most people okay. are calling it, the Heartland uh, model or mar Heartland Geography model. Now, I don't know for sure, but I'm guessing that for a lot of people who come to your presentations, probably one of the most compelling pieces of evidence for the Heartland model is that Joseph Smith himself was a pretty big advocate of this. Um, yeah, there, there's, there's some aspects of that. Um, there's been a lot of speculation about what Joseph Smith did and didn't say. There's only a few documents that we have where Joseph Smith is known to have actually written the document and actually affixed his, his signature on the bottom of it. Those documents seem to indicate he never came out and directly said, you know, this is the, the area. But there are several places, like for example, in his uh, letter that he wrote while on Zion's camp, he wrote a letter to his wife, Emma, and he said, we are wandering over the plains of the Nephites. And they're in Illinois. You know, they have the Wentworth letter and so forth, the uh, Zelf accounts that, that, that uh, tend to uh, support a North American study for the Book of Mormon. But he never came out and said, you know, this is exactly the... Down in Independence, Missouri, the, uh, the Nephite altar? The Nephite altar is one of those places where, that, you know, where he did say that was a specific place and it was specifically a Nephite altar there. So, okay. yeah. So, I mean, what, how do you feel right now? Because it seems like... Um, it seems like you're kind of in a tough spot. You've got the BYU guys and the Fair and Farms guys g yeah. going for a Mesoamerican theory, and, and it seems like the the church institution kind of wants to uh, avoid giving uh, uh, promoting one view over the other. So, I mean, do you feel like it's uh, pretty tough right now in, in sort of the, the landscape of of uh, I mean, do, how is it going for you? Sorry if that sounds. No, no yeah. I, I'm excited. I mean, the evidence just keeps continuing to uh, to come in. I mean, you know they. The, uh, for example, we've got four new presentations that just in our, we did in our national conference here recently, and one of them was on the Phoenicia expedition. I don't know if you've heard about that one, but it's a, a, a group of non-LDS people. They actually have, uh, they built a 600 BC Phoenician ship, and they built it over in Syria, sailed it down the Red Sea, and then around Africa, and then Right to, and, and when they came around Africa, their plan was is to go up on the west side of Africa, but instead the, the natural oceanic currents and winds literally took them straight towards North America. They got within 350 miles of making landfall in Puerto Rico, okay. and this was just last year. They just finished up that uh, expedition in, uh, in October of, uh, of last year. So very, very recent information. A lot of people have said, well, you know, Lehi's voyage couldn't have worked because of the fact that... Uh, that if you go the other direction, the History Channel just came out with a documentary called uh, Who Really Discovered America? And in that, they actually, by using uh, what they call uh, drifters in the ocean, they actually were able to, to, to calculate the amount of time it would have taken for, uh, for Lehi's journey to, uh, to have occurred, and it said 580 days. That's just four months short of two years. That's a long time on the water, and you know, for you have 25 or 30 people, it's going to be almost impossible to store that much water and food for that team, that distance. Yeah. But when they came around Africa instead, um, number one, they could have, they could have stopped anywhere in Long Africa and, and resupplied water and food. But even if they didn't, if they had only six months supply of food, they could have made it to North America because it only took them uh, six months time frame to go all the way from uh, Saudi Arabian Peninsula all the way around to North America. Um, there's, that's, that's one of the presentations. One of the other presentations is on metals. It's been one of the biggest Achilles heels of the Book of Mormon is the lack, virtually complete lack of any metallurgy uh, in the archaeology of Central America. Especially advanced metallurgy? Or any metallurgy. I mean, any, any, any evidence for, see, the, the ores are all there, and so they argue for that, but the problem is, is if you have ores, you need to also have things, for example, like smelters smelting and evidence for mining, evidence for actual artifacts. So how does the Great Lakes theory, the Heartland model, help you with that? Well, the, the Hopewell Mound Builders uh, civilization actually is almost exactly the same time frames as the Nephite civilization of the Book of Mormon. And the correlations there are absolutely stunning. There's, we've actually been able to identify at least 45 different correlations between the Mound Builder civilization and the, um, and the Nephite civilization of the Book of Mormon. 
And so, and they, I mean, basically the Nephites supposedly arrived about 600 or so BC, and then they abruptly ended at about 400 AD. Could you the civilization uh, that I'm talking about with the Hope Belt, with the mound builders, they start to show up in the archaeological record between three and 400 BC. But by all archaeological accounts, right around 400 AD, the civilization completely collapses. You'll have to let me review the video and get the, get the details cool, down yeah. and it's listen to it because I'm not I'm not a this is new to me. Yeah. I don't really follow it much. But can, let me ask you a question yeah. about um, yeah. kind of a basic issue. Yeah. When the Book of Mormon comes out, it seems like it's answering a lot of people's questions about where the Indians came from and what their ancestry is. And it seems like even in the DNC, when Smith is telling people to go preach the gospel to the Lamanites, yeah. he's talking about the Native Americans that they can see and talk to. And I mean, they're there. Who are the Lamanites, um, and what bearing does the Heartland model have on identifying them, or or this whole idea of the of the intro to the Book of Mormon, or was it the title? Yeah, the introduction page that was changed. The issue yeah. of um, I know that was a later edition that was then later changed, but in, in, the idea, uh, yeah, but the general well. idea that the, the Native Americans are the um, that that their principal ancestors are the Lamanites. So what would you say to that? Yeah, well, basically the the only thing that we really know for sure when it comes down to that kind of thing. And I say, I say that as a as a you know member of the church, obviously, is that um, when when the Lord commanded Joseph Smith to take the gospel to the quote unquote Lamanites, he immediately dispatched four missionaries. Um, he he dispatched uh, there's um, Parley P. Pratt and uh, Peter Whitmer Jr. and uh, Oliver Cowdery and Zyba Peterson. Where did those first four missionaries go? And this was all recorded actually in the Doctrine and Covenants. Well, they went to New York, Ohio, and Missouri. And uh, Parley P. Pratt actually recorded the tribes that they actually went to go see at, the, at that time. And what's interesting to me is that when they've done the DNA sequencing on those specific tribes, it turns out that those tribes actually do have this DNA lineage that was found in the, in the mounds of the Hopewell Mound Builders that carbon dated in the Book of Mormon time frames, and they have the same, these, these same lineages that are in these uh, Jewish populations. So as far as that's concerned, um, you know, certainly the North American Native Americans among the Algonquin speaking language groups, I believe, have the strongest evidence in favor of it. Um, so, I mean, this idea where, like yeah. Spencer Kimball, he was really big on having Everybody. youth conferences, Lamanite youth conferences, and he draws them into Salt Lake. And, and uh, I mean, he's pretty confident about their identity. And even in a lot of the, the missionary work done to, to Native Americans, is a kind of giving to them a kind of identity and future hope of their their restoration their gathering in terms of the book of mormon story do you think that's still legitimate today i mean it, it, it i mean i'm an outsider i'm not a non-mormon i obviously don't affirm the book of mormon as inspired of god but um I, but as an outsider I'm, let me ask you i mean would that be legitimate if they picked that up today because it seems like they've abandoned that sort of missionary effort to to connect with the the, the Native Americans in North America? With, with, the, with the Lamanites, I, yeah. I, I wouldn't say it's been abandoned in any way. Um, you know, the, the fact is, is that they haven't uh, accepted the gospel as fast as we would have liked to. But, but another interesting thing that we've actually discovered as we've done more of the research on this is that, um, is that there's actually this civilization I was mentioning before, you know, that, that we know that it was ancestral to modern-day Native Americans. Okay. Um, but what's interesting is that we know almost nothing about this civilization. Why is that? And it turns out that there was actually uh, religious and political and scientific agendas to actually kind of erase some of this history. We are now just finding out how advanced the civilization really was. If you had a Native American here tonight and you were in a gospel conversation with him trying to promote the, the LDS restoration to him, could you see yourself uh, identifying, kind of giving him an identity as a, uh, as a, as a Lamanite and giving him a sort of uh, this idea of the, the gathering of the Lamanites and that could be a part of what he could be? Is that, is that conceivable to you? Um, I don't know. I mean, that, that, that doesn't lie on my responsibility to, to, to decide that kind of thing. Um, I'm just saying that the DNA aspect of it um, indicates a North American setting for the Book of Mormon based on these, uh, these tribes that are here and the, the Algonquin-speaking tribes. So to a simpleton like me... But there are other tribes, though, for example, here in the, uh, in the Southwest and so forth. The Hopi, for example, they have some amount of that haplogroup X DNA. Um, the, the Navajo have between about 6 to 7 percent of this type of DNA. Um, the further you get away from the source population, the more uh, diluted 
the DNA of that population become. So like if, if you were to go into a population of, you know, of let's say Chinese, um, you know, and, and intermarry there, it wouldn't be very many generations before your, your great-great-grandchildren would have so little of your DNA still that they it wouldn't show up really anymore. So to I'm on this issue, I'm pretty simpleton. I I don't I'm not I don't really study a lot into Mormon yeah. geography issues. Right. But on a simple level here, yeah. is it still true that the principal ancestors of the Native Americans are the Lamanites? Um, well, that's what the, uh, the 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 change in the in the uh, introduction page of the Book of Mormon I think was about. Well, I mean, for for, for you and your you personally, you individually, your opinion. Yeah. Um, do you think that's still a legitimate claim? I know that the church is trying to pull back from trying to endorse any sort of geographic right. uh, position, right. but for you and your pers personal opinion, is it still a legitimate position? Is it still is it still true for for you and as far as, far as you know for the principle that the principal ancestors of the of the Native Americans are the Lamanites? I would have to say probably not because of the fact that you have uh, you know pre prior to this you have an Asiatic population that was is known to have been here before you know um, and I mean the Maya civilization was already well in advance you know prior so to So it's it's diluted as as of 175 years ago 180 years ago when the church is starting even then it's diluted to the point where we don't know if a native americans a lamanite um, I think probably the, the best possible marker that you have is the haplogroup X DNA marker. In terms of skin color, I mean, 180 years ago, they don't know about DNA, but when they look at a Native American, they say, oh, Lamanite, was that legitimate? Um, I don't know what the, you know, when, you, when it goes to, to looking at somebody, I mean, many of the Native Americans actually look quite um, Asiatic. You know, I mean, if you go to take a look at people over in, uh, like in Mongolia and so forth, you see most Native Americans actually look very much like that. And that's actually what the DNA tends to, uh, to show. Now, the haplogroup X issue, I assume, is not without controversy? Oh, no, it's definitely controversial. <laughs> the, pri the primary controversy there, though, is actually a, the, in, as, as to when it arrived in the Americas. You know, for, according to uh, the, the uh, you know, DNA studies and that kind of stuff, um, and phylogenetic dating of DNA, the, uh, the fact is, is that um, when it comes down to the haplogroup X DNA, they think it showed up here about 40,000 years ago, which, of course, would way predate Lehi's journey in the Book of Mormon. But, uh, but we have to understand the basis of the dating. And the basis of that dating is, is that they assume that humans and chimpanzees, or, or basically uh, apes, um, actually split about five to six million years ago. And then they look at the, the, uh, the difference between humans and chimps and say, okay, there's this much difference in this, and this is how much time it took. Therefore, this is the rate of change that we would expect to have. But the problem is, is it doesn't, mansion, doesn't tap into... Uh, uh, mention the uh, the fact that there has been other studies that have been done by by on, on real people okay where like uh, grandmothers and then their granddaughters or even great granddaughters okay and when they actually have, have looked at how fast the DNA changes between grandmothers and granddaughters the rate of change was so much faster that there's no way it could have been five to six million years ago between humans and chimps where do you think uh, that I think is false because I don't agree with the assumption that humans came from chimps. If you had to give an intro to me, so I'm, I'm, I don't really spend all the time on the geography issues and the DNA issues, in a nutshell, why do you think, where do you think the farms guys on this issue have got it wrong? I know it's a, it's, it's a, a pretty big thing. Um, well, well, basically a couple of things. First off, a lot of people were, uh, were looking for you know, certain things that were mentioned in the Book of Mormon. For example, one of the big, big areas why I think that the, you know, it's been assumed that it was in Central America is because of the fact that the Maya had a written language. And it wasn't known that any Native Americans in North America actually had a written language. But as it turns out, um, as I, I was just mentioned to another fellow over here, um, just very recently, in fact, um, there, was a, there was a stone that is actually recovered in an official archaeological dig of the Smithsonian Institute in 1889, it was in eastern Tennessee along the Mount, along Bat Creek. And uh, I've heard about this. This is not without controversy as well, I assume. No, no it, it, there's there's definitely going to be some controversy there because it goes against what the the uh, archaeological norm is 
And whenever you do that, there's going to be some controversy, you know, but... Uh, some providence issues, though, some questions about providence with the Bat Creek... Back, I mean, I have heard about this Bat um, Creek inscription. Well, actually, actually the, th the, the, the fact is, is it was actually recovered in an official dig, the Smithsonian Institute. The Smithsonian Institute didn't question it. They published it in one of their... Uh, publications about a year and a half later. So why is that controversial, this this particular thing with the farms? What's, where do they get that wrong? Sorry, go ahead. Well, farms doesn't really even go there. They, 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 I don't, as far as I know, I don't think that they've actually addressed the Bat Creek Stone okay. stuff, but because that's actually so brand new. Um, but what happened was is that the uh, Smithsonian ended up with it. They, they published the stone, and they published it, and they said it was Paleo-Cherokee. Okay. Um, about 75 years later, there was a, a group of, of uh, non- non-Mormon, but they're Hebrew scholars, and they happened to see the publication, and they, were, they saw it from the other side, they said, wait a minute, this stone has been published upside down. If you rotate the stone 180 degrees, and then, and then take a look at the inscription, it's perfectly legible Hebrew. Mm -hmm. And what's really interesting is, is that the, the, uh, the translation of the stone, and again, this is by non-Mormons, um, it says that the, the stone's translation is actually for Judea or for the Judeans, which is a clear reference to the old world. But uh, about a year and a half ago, the Cherokee actually demanded the stone back from the Smithsonian under the NAGPRA Act, uh, North American uh, Graves Protection Repatriation Act. And they actually got the stone back um, and they sent it to American Petrographic Services out of uh, St. Paul, Minnesota. There's no Mormons involved with that th that I'm aware of. Um, and then um, they did a full-on scientific analysis of the stone, including uh, scattering mic uh, electron microscopy on the stone. Um, they looked at the weathering rind on the stone, the inscription, and so forth. Um, and they have come to the conclusion on the analysis that it is authentic and that it has to be as, as old as the mound. And the mound is a Hopal mound builder mound, which means it was somewhere between 300 B.C. and 400 A.D. So a question for you. And, and it had these actual artifacts from the Hopewell Mound Builders that are, that are indicative of the Hopewells as well. So we know it was in the time frame of the Book of Mormon. Here we have a stone with an inscription now scientifically verified to be ancient Hebrew and it's found in eastern Tennessee. So can I ask you some just some more questions? A couple more before we get yeah. going? Yeah, I okay. Be able to pass out some yeah, I'll, 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 I'll let you go, I promise. A little, just a little bit here. Okay. Um, so, as a, as a non Mormon, one of my biggest reasons uh, for identifying the Book of Mormon as not, having, as not being of an ancient origin yeah. is that it seems like, and, I, um, and in fact, and no, like well, let me put a pause button on that. Let me ask you a question. What theology in the Book of Mormon do you think is, is Mormon, distinctively Mormon? Well, I mean, when it comes down to, you know, that kind of thing, it's, it's the, you know, my, my belief and my understanding as far as that's concerned is, is based on a, on a spiritual standpoint, obviously. You know, I was... Uh, in terms of your affirmation of it, but in terms of the content right. of the Book of Mormon, what theology what does it... Kind of uniquely a Mormon? Yeah. Is that what you're talking about? Um, well, just, uh, I mean, there's so many things that... <laughs> <laughs> Just a couple of big things. Yeah, I, I don't want to take up. I, I'll, I'll keep my promise to cut this short soon. <laughs> well, I mean, you know, I, I think. Um yeah, you know, just some of the things about like re, you know when it comes down to repentance and re, re, when it comes down to um, um, how we need to be in, engaged in doing good things. You know that we can't just say that we're saved or, or believe that you know that, that by that only you know. It's uh, my, my personal feeling is that, as we've talked about in the church a lot of times, we are saved by grace after what we can do. And that's, you know, and... Uh, we, and for you, that means fulfilling conditions of obedience, I assume. It means try to, try to obey the, the Lord, you know. Um, you know, as, as a parent myself, you know, if I have kids that, that uh, disobey me or the law and so forth, you know, the law will take care of some of that, you know, to some extent. But uh, if, you, if you really want to show your love for someone, you, you do what they ask you to do. So it's not, not that the obedience is merely a fruit, but is it fair to say that you believe it's a, it's a precondition for, for receiving some blessings of grace, like forgiveness or eternal life? Or? I, I think showing, showing our, uh, you know, doing, doing good works shows our faith to some extent. But ultimately, there's no way that we can save ourselves. Ultimately, that is... is you know, Christ that has, that does that. Okay, so, so if, 
un my, I'm gonna unpause what I was about to say earlier. One of the biggest reasons I don't affirm the Book of Mormon and reject it as, as, as it claiming an ancient origin is it seems like a lot of the theology in it that it's trying, the controversies that it's tr seemingly trying to solve, the theology it's trying to promote, is, uh, is pretty common to 19th century Protestantism. It seems, it seems like it, it, would, it would fit very well in a 19th century context um, and it, to be blunt with you, we kind of described it as a kind of confused Protestantism. But one of the things that I've been sharing with a lot of Mormons on the street as almost a kind of conversation starter is if I can share a Book of Mormon verse with them and I go to Moroni 8.18 and I ask, can we read it? It says, for we know that God is not a partial God, neither a changeable being, but he is unchangeable from all eternity to all eternity. And the content wise, I read that and I think, amen, you know, let out a big Baptist, you know, hallelujah, amen, you know, like, yeah, God's unchangeable from all eternity to all eternity. Uh -huh. But the, and I, and I, you could probably already tell why that would be of interest to me. Um, in 1844, Smith teaches, we have imagined and supposed that God was God from all eternity, but I will refute that idea and take away the veil so that you may see. And there's this whole theology that develops of, of a, a kind of genealogy of gods, as man is, God once was, as God is, man may be. Right. So how do you address the, the issue? I mean, uh, add one little um, qualification or angle to this. Blake Osler, um, Mormon scholar, right. especially in theology, he, uh, he takes the position that when the Book of Mormon was translated, Smith was so actively participating in the translation process that he actually was injecting 19th century theology, or, or uh, I should say, um, yeah. in his own words, perhaps more something like, something God wanted him to teach you know, into not, the not into, the, into the Book of Mormon. So there was a kind of merging of ancient material and modern material. But the well, bigger issue, how do you, how do you deal with the Moroni 818 issue yeah. and the Protestant theology issue? It seems like a very classical view of God, a, Pro a Protestant-ish view of God. And even when I read a lot of these passages, my, my go ahead. My personal thought is basically that, uh, you know, most of the Christian religions are based on similar kinds of things. You know, if we, if we all started from the teachings of Christ, even though we may go in different directions and so forth to some extent, there's going to be some of that kind of thing that still remains. Um, you know, why is it that we have all the all different religions? You know, it's because everybody takes a look at what they what they see in the Bible and they see in the New Testament and so forth, and they and they uh, interpret it their you know however they look at it from their own you know standpoint, their own viewpoint. And I think that's where Joseph Smith and and so forth. There's going to be there, certainly there would be certain similar things that were going to be there. You know, it's not, it's not, it's not a complete, uh, re I mean, obviously, we believe it's a, uh, it's a uh, restoration of what Christ originally uh, developed, you know, and as, as he, you know, got his disciples together and so forth and taught them. So that's what we're really believing is, is that, you know, that, 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 that was the case. This is a restoration of that. And so... But the church hasn't abandoned the theology of the Book of Mormon on God being etern unchangeable from all eternity to all eternity? Not that I'm aware of. I, you know, I don't know. You know, again, I, I, I am. My, my, my specialty is on the uh, physical evidences more so than on the uh, theology itself. So I would feel that there'd probably be people who are better able to answer those questions than I. But, uh, but from my personal standpoint, you know, when it says that God is an unchangeable person, you know, I mean, it, there's there's a lot of things in the, even the Bible that talk. You know, that that you know, different prophets and so forth did uh, did different things. Even did things kind of somewhat differently you know and, explain relevance sir yeah <laughs> well well I'm just trying to think for example uh, uh, you know just sometimes there were con kind of conflicting things like you know for example um, you know with with uh, the commandment to you know not lie but yet uh, Ruth is told to lie to the to the people to save to so, save the prophets and so forth so we're on 818 could be could be you're perhaps implying an example of a contradiction between a Book of Mormon prophet and other I think, I think LDS church prophets. There's different. There are different, different levels of, of understanding of the laws. You know, for example, the, you know, the law of gravity. Obviously, if I jump up in the air, I'm going to come back down. But by using an airplane and using other laws like aerodynamics and uh, and lift and drag and so forth, um, by using those physical properties, we can actually overcome that and fly across the nation, fly across the world. Well, are we defying the law of gravity? No, we're working within it using other laws. 
And I think that sometimes we try to be too simpleton and say, well, you know, the Lord, you know, God said this one thing, not realizing that there may be a whole, a whole group of different levels of understanding of those laws. You know, for example, in the Doctrine and Covenants, we talk about, uh, you know, it says, the Lord says that you should obey my law. But under that is the, you know, you should, al you should also obey the laws of the land as far as they're constitutional. Well, hey, so which one is it? I want to keep my promise here and wrap things up. But uh, if, if you wouldn't mind, uh, real quickly here, uh, would you let me just share a short testimony with you, just a kind of declaration of my belief, and, then, and I'll hand the mic off to you and you do the same thing? Fine, yeah. All right. So I, I just want to tell you, Mr. Meldrum, by the way, you're a nice guy, a left handshake here. Yeah, I really appreciate you talking with me. Uh, I hope I've, you feel like I've been fair to you. But, yeah. but you know, one of the I things I'm teaching... Oh, you're welcome. Yeah. One of the things I've been teaching on the street here, and I firmly believe, I know on account of what God's Word, is that God is from everlasting to everlasting. He's holy, 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 the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. And in principle, absolutely, God is unchangeable from all eternity to all eternity. One of the reasons we should worship Him, adore Him, obey Him, bow down before Him, follow Him, is because He's the most... Uh, reliable of all beings. He's the greatest of all beings. He's the most high God. He says in Isaiah 43 10, before me there is no God formed, neither shall there be after me. You know, next chapter, I'm the first and the last. Besides me there is no God. And that's the God that we're supposed to worship. And, and any, any other God that we, we would be led astray to would be a false God. And so the difference is between blasphemy or worship, idolatry or honoring God, having a relationship with God or being alienated from God. So my testimony on behalf of uh, just echoing God's word to people here is that I want them to embrace a biblical view of God that says He is holy, 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 always was, especially never was a mere sinful mortal had to grow up to become a God. And I want them to repent of this false view of God and trust this awesome God of the Bible for free forgiveness, eternal life. But uh, hey, I'll let you go for it. <laughs> well, I appreciate your sharing that. You know, and uh, I, it, as far as my, you know, when it comes down to it, um, my testimony is actually from a... Uh, You know, I'm not sure exactly the best way to, to explain it, but the, but the bottom line is, is when it comes down to it, um, I also believe that our Heavenly Father is actually our Father. And I say that meaning, meaning that He cares for us like a Father does, that He is our actual Father, that He um, has, the, that He wants for us, His children, you know, as, as a Father myself. The greatest gift I could possibly um, wish for my children would be for them to find happiness in their lives, to be able to find truth and be able to, to come back. If, if, I, if I was God, I, mean, I would want my children to come and be part of that, be part of me, be part of my kingdom. You know, it says that there's many mansions. Well, why, why did God have many mansions if he doesn't plan on sharing with his children? And I think any parent would, would give their lives for their children. And I know that our Heavenly Father would do so as well. And so my, my personal thought is, is that Father, just like I'm, my, I'm, I'm my, my Father's son, and I have a son. I have two sons. And, uh, and I um, would like to be with them. Now, I wouldn't want to have them be separate from me. And, uh, and bottom line is, is when it comes down to our, our, our Heavenly Father, we look at it more of a as, as as more of a kind of a natural thing, a natural uh, thing where people are are um, literally children of a loving and unrighteous and all-knowing and omniscient and amazing heavenly Father. But it's not, but but not not some kind of a nebulous, really um, nondescript. But actually, a real person. I mean, Moses talked about uh, you know talking with our with with him face to face. You know, so I think that he has he has actual countenance that uh, that if we were to see our heavenly Father, he would look basically like us. We would look like him, I should say, is <laughs> really more more correctly. But uh, but I, I know that uh, many Christian people um, look at this differently. And I, don't, and, and I don't think that we as a church try to say that other people who believe differently are blaspheming. Um, we look at it as two different opinions. 
and which one is which one is correct you know so my personal my, my personal testimony comes from a uh, a, um, a, a careful reading and study of the Book of Mormon and, and uh, the, the different scriptures, the, the New Testament, Old Testament, etc. And then taking it to my father and asking him, is this true? And I'm out here today because of the fact that, uh, that I know that, the, that this is true from a, from a spiritual standpoint. And I also know that anybody can have that same witness for themselves if they are willing to uh, to, to do a little bit of effort and uh, just read the Book of Mormon and uh, and ask our Father in Heaven so well hey I want to well, love to follow up but I keep my word here I hate Mr. Merritt I do a proper right hand shake here and I just want to really appreciate Mr. Meldrum for doing this and uh, Thank you. A little, so that's it okay. that's take care wrap. that's a wrap listen appreciate it hey, you're welcome